In today's video, we're going to rank all 30 special random encounters and tactics. Starting out with one of my favorites, we have the Pet Boy Encounter. When entering the map, you'll come across a personified version of the series' mascot, the Vault Boy. He's erroneously named Pet Boy in Tactics, however, which is a common misconception. The Pet Boy is the name of the character who appears on the Pet Boy 2000 in both Vault 1 and 2, not Vault Tech's corporate mascot that's become a symbol of the franchise. If the player has less than six recruits in their party, the Pit Boy will join the player's team and has the unique description. Is he a bizarre genetic freak? Is he an animatronic escape from some long-destroyed amusement park? Is he an educational aid gone wrong? No, he's Pit Boy, damn it, and he's here to kick ass and take names. Pit Boy actually runs from sickly sweet 50s jargon to the kick ass dialect of a soldier at war. Unfortunately, this description is never shown due to a bug. And even worse, his name is displayed as Core Pet Boy, which is the character's internal name. Despite these oversights, this is easily one of my favorite encounters in the game. Solid 9 out of 10. The next encounter is called Ever Ready Bunnies, and features a map of 40 invisible characters all reciting the phrase, It keeps going and going a reference to the Energizer Bunny. Despite being invisible, the bunnies can be killed using explosive weapons, burst fire, or setting your team to overwatch mode. Killing one will turn the others hostile, and makes it look like your squad is tripping balls as they fire in every direction at invisible targets. Each bunny carries microfusion cells in their inventory, but it doesn't seem possible to actually loot their bodies. Killing them strangely causes the player to lose karma, and killing all of them will make it very likely for the player to receive the evil ending when completing the game. Apart from talking, they don't actually do anything, but a death note suggests they were once going to attack the player, stating, This is a somewhat eerie setting, with one bunny, then another, and finally as many bunnies as we can get on screen without slowdown. Then they turn nasty. It's unknown why this was altered so heavily, but the initial idea was more interesting to me than its final incarnation, so I'll rank this a 4 out of 10. The following special encounter features the crashed Russian space station Mir. There's also a nearby shrine seemingly made by tribals who worship the space station as some sort of god. This reference was very topical since Mir was deliberately deorbited and destroyed a few days after Tactics' release, but it doesn't work nearly as well today. There's nothing to do, but the model is very well done and earns it a 5 out of 10. The next one is an homage to the film Pitch Black, and fittingly plays out on a nearly pitch black map, only lit by a few scattered radioactive pools. Not long after spawning here, you'll run into the main character of that film, Reddick. He walks around saying lines lifted straight out of the movie like, All you people are so scared of me, but it ain't me you gotta worry about now. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? And don't step out of the light. Soon you're all attacked by a giant swarm of 18 Deathclaws, which is more than any other encounter in the game, and I think more than you fight in any area in the entire franchise outside of Deathclaw Promontory. If you manage to exit the map while Riddick is still alive, you'll be able to recruit him onto your team. A death note suggests the death claws were intended to burrow up out of the ground and attack you, similar to the creatures in the film, but in game they're placed above ground like normal. This is a fun, challenging encounter that potentially leads to gaining a powerful companion, but it's also an aged pop culture reference, so 6 out of 10. Speaking of pop culture references that don't hit as well 20 years later, we have the Titanic encounter, which has a dead NPC next to a life preserver, a badly drawn sketch of a naked woman, and a necklace named the Heart of the Ocean. The necklace can be looted and is one of the most valuable items in the game, starting out with a base price of 20,000 ring pulls, which are tactics form of currency. The crudely drawn sketch is amusing though, so I'll give it a 5 out of 10. The next map is Copper Tops, a giant warehouse filled with NPCs named Human Batteries running on treadmills, which is an homage to the Matrix. There's a nearby robot, and according to a developer note, it captured all of them to generate electricity, and then use that electricity to somehow conquer the world. It says lines like, Faster, human. I only need three million more humans so I can take over the world. And the power. This encounter is pretty fun, and I'm a huge fan of the first Matrix film, so 7 out of 10. 
The Four Horsemen of the Post-Apocalypse Encounter stars the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, a reference to the characters of the same name in the Book of Revelations. The four of them are hanging out at a makeshift camp, depressed and bored because they've had nothing to do since the Great War. For example, Famine will say, How do these people eat? Nothing can grow here. Wake me up when there's something to do. And who got the chips? War arguably has the best lines. Maybe we should give peace a chance. I liked it better before the war. And war never changes? Fuck you. You don't know me. While death will state, they can destroy things here at Thanos. Stupid bastards, no respect for life. And 7.5 billion people died. Just like that. They can be attacked, but are extremely difficult to kill as they each have over 14,000 HP. If you mouse over them, you'll see they start off almost dead, and they actually have a maximum HP of over 100,000, giving them what I'm pretty sure is the highest health of any NPC in the game. It also implies that they've been slowly rotting away without anything to do, which is pretty great. This encounter was apparently planned to be even larger at one point, as there are four unused actors named Apathy, Care, Give, and Lethargy. These reuse their existing models, but it's unclear how they would have been used. I think this is no question a 10 out of 10, and I'd put it up there at the best encounters in the series. During the encounter Reaver Dance, the player comes across a group of Reavers, who are the Raider equivalent of the Brotherhood of Steel, putting on a dance performance on a stage. There's nothing to do apart from watching them and they can't be killed, resulting in an underwhelming experience. Reaver Dance is a pun of the River Dance though, so I'll give it a little credit and a 3 out of 10. The Letus map has two characters named Fat Man and Weedle Boy talking to one another, stating, Damn Moody's drop crap loot. Gimme your stuff, Brotherhood posers. And so I player killed him and took his loot. This is a tip of the hat to Leet Speak, a system of modified spelling where letters are replaced by symbols that originated on early internet forums, supposedly created to sidestep language filters that would prevent users from discussing offensive or illegal subject matter. This isn't the worst encounter by any means, but it doesn't manage to stand out to me either, so 3 out of 10. Someone at Microforte really loved Brahmin, because Tactics features 5 unique Brahmin encounters which are definitely some of the best in the game. The B-1000 encounter stars a silver Brahmin who walks around an abandoned factory, spouting puns from the Terminator films like, Fuck moo, asshole. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Brahmin Dine Systems, Moodle 101. I am a cybernetic organism, living tissue over metal T-bone. Hasta la vista, Kaffee. No problemo. Your clothes. Give them to Moo. A phase 2 plasma pulse laser in the 40 watt range. And of course, Moo will be back. Internally, the character's name is even Brominator. When killing the B-1000, it resurrects itself several times before actually dying and dropping an Uzi. The resurrection animation was made by taking a death animation where a character is melted and running it backwards. Everything about this encounter is fantastic, and it gets a 10 out of 10. In the second Brahmin encounter, the player comes across a Brahmin defended by sandbags and laser turrets. If the player destroys the turrets and defeats the mutated cow, you can acquire the unique item Brahmin armor. When equipped, the armor gives you an armor class of 57 and transforms the wearer into a Brahmin. Its description reads, A special suit of armor. While wearing, you can move through herds of Brahmin unseen. While Brahmin can be used in multiplayer, this is the only time that you can control a Brahmin during the single player campaign. This is also the only armor type that can be equipped by robot recruits, but unfortunately NPCs who wear it are unable to fire their weapons, making it a useless but very funny joke item. 8 out of 10. In Brahmin Poker, the protagonist finds a group of Brahmin playing a game of poker around a table, saying lines such as, Cut the deck already, ante up, keep your hooves above the table, and nobody's that lucky. If the player approaches them, they'll all run away from the table, saying comical lines like, Holy cow, it's the feds. Whoa, it's a bust. Shit, um, moo moo. And best of all, Bessie's gonna kill me. After they flee, you can discover almost 30,000 ring pulls on the table. This is likely an homage to the painting Dogs Playing Poker, which would later be parodied in New Vegas too. This is definitely one of my favorites and earns a 9 out of 10. 
In the next Brahmin base map, the player finds a sign that says don't tip the Brahmin, placed in front of a fenced-in group of Brahmin. In this map, you have the unique ability to run up and tip over Brahmin, something that would later appear in both Fallout 3 and New Vegas. Considering this pioneered one of the funniest joke mechanics in the franchise, it's deserving of an 8. The fifth and final one is the worst in my opinion, centered around a Brahmin named Cole that states, I see dead Brahmin. Around it are seven transparent ghost Brahmin running around, a spoof of the film The Sixth Sense. If attacked, Cole will become hostile, but the ghost Brahmin can't be killed or attacked. This probably would have been more entertaining 20 years ago, but now it's a 1 out of 10 for me. Despite being based around the Brotherhood of Steel, Tactics only has a single special encounter based around the faction, titled Uprising. Here you'll find a Brotherhood bunker with a layout reminiscent of Lost Hills and Fallout 1. The bunker is guarded by two Brotherhood soldiers in power armor named Paladin Hubert and Paladin McCarthy. Around them are the corpses of civilians who apparently tried to break into the bunker and were killed by the Brotherhood guards. They say lines like, We had a little civil unrest. We took care of it. Last time they complained, right? They might have been armed for all we know. And we checked. They weren't carrying anything good. Unfortunately, the door to the bunker can't be opened, but you can either kill or pickpocket the Paladins to take their Vindicator miniguns and 2,000 rounds of 7.62 ammunition. Despite being inaccessible and blocked by the roof, the designers actually did make an interior for the bunker, decorated with a terminal, containers, and a staircase that leads down to an unfinished lower level. Presumably, they intended to open this up for the player at one point, but never had time to finish it. Regardless, I do like that it depicts the Brotherhood's colonization of the Midwest as negative, as the game typically paints them as benevolent, earning it a 6 out of 10. In the next map, you come across a floating skull named Mort, a companion in Black Isle's Planescape Torment. He floats around the map saying, By the powers, my feet are killing me. This weather is doing wonders for my flaky, chalky white skin, and this is not my century. He was planned to have a conversation with the player that was later cut, but the text still remains and reads, Whoa, one minute I'm banging around the cage, the next I'm in the middle of some sand pile with delusions of being a desert. Must have been that shortcut through the brothel window that dumped me here. Mort looks at you. Great. Another bunch of sand dwelling primes. Look, I'm a mem. Oh, pike it. Any of you primes know of any portals around here? No? Just my luck. First, I get saddled with some burk with a brain box like a sack of stones, and whose sole vocabulary is, can I ask you some questions? And before I can lose him, he ditches me. Great. The model looks great and the homage is nice, but it's sad the conversation that actually explains why he's in the Fault universe didn't make it in. 4 out of 10. The next special encounter features a destroyed plane and a skeleton whose name tag reads Amelia, a reference to Amelia Earhart's legendary disappearance. I think this is a fun idea to explain the mystery of her disappearance, so 6 out of 10. The next encounter has a guy named Phil the Nuka-Cola dude riding a bike and saying, Stupid friggin' Nuka-Cola? Why I have to drag it around the desert? Stupid friggin' tradition? And 73 more stops to go, damn it. If you attack him, he'll retaliate using a Molotov cocktail and state, Take this. Stupid friggin' bicycle? And no respect for tradition. His dialogue file has a normally hidden description that reads, Roll. Phil has the thankless job of riding around the wasteland and refilling all of the Nuka-Cola machines that litter it. It's a tradition passed down rather stupidly from generation to generation. Phil is not impressed. According to his text file, he was meant to have a conversation that would have read, Oh, well hey there. Just doing the rounds, you know. Gotta make the deliveries, or so my dad told me before he died. Just like his papa and his papa before that. It's tradition. Of course, it does get mighty thirsty doing this work, but am I allowed to drink any of the cola? No, sir. I ain't. That's tradition for you. Well, I best be going. I've got a long, long, long list of Nuka Cola machines to refill. See ya. Unfortunately, this was never recorded, and the idea the developers were trying to get across isn't well defined as a result. Regardless, I love that this not only explains why Nuka Cola can still be found so many years later, but also that Phil apparently has the only working bicycle in the entire Fallout universe, earning it an 8 out of 10. 
In Brothers Grimm, you stumble across two super mutants named Joe and Jim Grimm, a reference to Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, who are famous for publishing Germanic fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel. Jim was injured by a landmine and Joe asked you to heal him. Hey you! Yeah you! Look, my brother Jim stepped on a mine and wrecked his foot. I know humans and super mutants are supposed to kill each other on sight, but I think it's time to leave the past in the past. Now, I don't want us to group hug and sing kumbaya and stuff, but maybe one of you guys can hook a mutant up, huh? What do you say? But can you help my brother? If you help them out, both brothers will join the player as potential recruits. Hey, thanks, pal. Maybe the master was wrong. Maybe you normal humans ain't all scum sucking flesh bags, and maybe it's me, but the old brotherhood would have shot first and asked questions later. We just might have to check out this new brotherhood for ourselves. See you around. Let's go, Gimpy. <laughs> it's one of only three encounters that has voice dialogue, but despite that, it's still underwhelming to me, earning it a 4 out of 10. During Deathclaw Liberation, there's some Deathclaws trapped inside of a giant cage out in the wasteland. Outside of it, there's an NPC named Janet Badal, a spoof of primatologist Jane Goodall. Greetings, fellow humanitarian. I'm Janet Badall, four-person for the Deathclaw Freedom Alliance. I am here for one purpose, to free poor, captive Deathclaws so that they may be free to roam the wasteland as nature intended. If you love nature as much as I do, you'll help me release some of the wasteland's most majestic, yet most misunderstood creatures. Immoral Deathclaw poaching can be stopped. We just have to work together. Let's go! After talking to her, she opens up the cage, runs inside, and dies horribly. Yes, my friends, you are free! Run! Run like the wind! Rejoice! It is God's will that... Ah! No! But I'm a friend! Afterwards, the death claws attack you, but thankfully their pathfinding is pretty bad and they often get trapped on the walls of the cage. A dev note mentions, Janet is an idiot, pure and simple. She thinks that death claws are cute and cuddly animals who deserve to run free as nature intended. Like I said, an idiot. Another note mentions that she was intended to shoot a guy who was guarding the cage, but this was removed from the final game. This encounter definitely made me laugh, and I'll give it a respectable 8 out of 10. Along with their fascination with Brahmin and pop culture references, the dev team was also obsessed with Canada. In Canadian Invasion, a group of tribals are waiting for Canadians to invade the US. Before you approach, they wait around saying, The attack could start at any minute. They're devious, these Canadians. I heard that Canada started the Great War, and they won't get past us. When you get close to them, their leader mistakes you for Canadian invaders and says, We don't speak with your kind, Canadian scum. We invaded your country once and we'll do it again. Immediately afterwards, they attack you while floating text like, Why don't you go back to Canada? Rotten, dirty, filthy, er, scum? You think you're so good, and I always wanted to be a lumberjack. A funny dev note mentions, Name, Morons. Role, Morons. These people honestly believe that while various military struggles play out on the West Coast, America has left itself open to an invasion from the North. One of these NPCs carries the water gun weapon, a unique acid-based weapon that can only be found here. The inclusion of that item bumps this up to a 7. In CPF vs PFC, the player runs across two groups picketing against each other, named the Canadian People Front and People's Front of Canada. They argue with one another about the future of Canada, and this is a reference to Monty Python's Life of Brian, which features two very similarly named groups. Judean People's Front. For the People's Front of Judea. This isn't a terrible encounter, but it's not particularly interesting either, so 3 out of 10. The Invasion Recreationist Encounter is a reference to the United States annexation of Canada prior to the Great War. A character named Clarice leads some NPCs to a line drawn in the dirt, then they cross that line and go back to a table to start drinking. After the reenactment, Clarice will say, Ah, the glory of battle. Have another drink, will you? Later, we'll put down the uprising of Edmonton, and there is a strong argument for showing that the Canadian Army wore pink. 
The other actors will state, well done everyone, that was close. I nearly peed my pants. Wait a minute, I did. And drunkenly singing, Oh say can you see, by the dawn's early light. A developer note states, They meet once a year in a muddy field to reenact the Great American Invasion of Canada, which consists of them drawing a line in the dirt and walking over it. Then they all get drunk, pack their inventories with booze. If you decide to fight them, you can loot a good bit of alcohol, but these guys are just too cute to kill. I think this is pretty funny and gets a 6 out of 10. There's also a handful of merchant-based encounters, and while most of them aren't notable, you can kill the traders and take everything they have in their inventories, making them some of the very best in terms of loot. The first we're looking at is Bizarre Day, a map filled with traders spouting various floating text. All of the dialogue here is a reference to EverQuest. Lines like, Buying words of possession and spoken. Has anyone seen my corpse? And 35 ROG looking for group. Please guys. Guys, I want to play. When attacked, they'll say, look out, player killer, and no fear, I wasn't ready. You can buy miscellaneous items from the traders, and one of them has the unique armor Devilthorn Jacket, which costs nearly 30,000 ring pulls. This item gives the wearer an armor class of 100, adds 10 to the strength stat, 50% resistance to fire damage, and reduces all incoming damage by 6 points. However, it also has a strength requirement of 75, making it impossible to ever equip without cheating. These stats were taken directly from a set of armor in Diablo 1 called the Demon Spike Cloak. I like the joke armor, but these references are pretty archaic at this point, so 3 out of 10. In the gas station encounter, the player comes across a character named Grandma inside a gas station. Amusingly, the prices for gas are shown to be in excess of $8,000 for a gallon of premium, showing just how bad inflation got before the bombs hit. She sells the player various miscellaneous items, but most notably has a unique item called Elixir of Life. It costs 5,000 ring pulls, but drinking it raises a recruit's endurance by one and gives them plus 15 hit points. She walks around stating, Things sure are quiet these days. I wonder when our Henry will be home, and that shipment of gas is getting mighty late. She has a conversation set up, but it's disabled in the final game. She would have said, Well, land sakes. Customers. It sure has been a while. I hate to disappoint you all, but we're fresh out of gas. I've been waiting on old Bert from in town to deliver it for, well, I don't know how long. Maybe there's something else that you need? We got Happy Pies, and I could whip y'all up some dandy lemonade. Or perhaps you'd like a swig of Grandma's own life-extending elixir. No? Oh well. Don't trouble yourself, sugar. Y'all come back now, you hear? Then a dev note reads, This station is run by a little old lady who hasn't quite caught on to the fact that the world ended outside her little piece of it. Grandma is not quite in touch with reality. It isn't clear how old she is, but she talks like she's from before the war. The environmental design here is great, and the idea was fun, but it's too bad her conversation was cut and doesn't hint at her apparent immortality. 5 out of 10. Another features a merchant in a tent guarded by several raiders. This is by far the best merchant special encounter in terms of loot, as the trader actually has a good selection of useful items like skill books. He also sells plastic explosives, and since NPCs have no way of knowing that you've activated and dropped it, you can use it to blow them up. Despite the explosive shenanigans, it's one of the worst encounters and gets a 1 out of 10. The next one has a trader surrounded by some civilians who are presumably buying goods, and a raider who's guarding him. The civilians strangely use a transparent model like the Ghost Brahmin in the Sixth Sense encounter. I don't think this was done deliberately since they can be killed unlike the Ghost Brahmin. Again, another 1 out of 10. In the Hermit encounter, the player finds a lone trader defended by six wolves that he apparently tamed. He has some valuable equipment and money, but attacking him will force you to fight his wolf pack. You can grab some good gear, but it's not interesting enough to score higher than a 1 either. In the Farmer encounter, you find a trader tending to his Brahmin, and he has a single round of depleted uranium 50 caliber, one of the game's rarest and most powerful forms of ammunition. Attacking him will make the Brahmin hostile, but other than a single bullet, it's pretty useless, so 1 out of 10 once more. 
In the next encounter, the player finds a character named Komodo Man who's wrestling a Komodo dragon in front of an audience, a parody of Steve Irwin. The audience says lines such as, What the hell is this guy doing? What's he doing to that poor creature? And is he insane? That's right, blokes and chillers. Gather round. What I have here is your typical giant mutated Komodo dragon. My namesake, if you will. A real beautiful animal. Now what I'm gonna do here is bloody dangerous, so I don't want any of you gallas to try this without supervision. Basically, I'm gonna annoy the living bejesus out of this here Komodo and see what he makes of that. Here I go! After a speech, he's almost immediately killed by the Komodo and the crowd leaves. He carries one of the rarest items in the game, the Komodo Pelt. It has no purpose other than being sold and can't be acquired without attacking Komodo Man before he's killed. Hitting him will draw him over to the fence and then you can pickpocket it from him. This one is definitely fun and gets a 7 out of 10. And that's all 30 special encounters and fall tactics. Some of them are genuinely great experiences like the Four Horsemen or B1000, but overall you can tell the developers wanted to do a lot more with many of these, but eventually had to chop them up due to the game's short development cycle. That's all for this episode. Have an awesome day, guys.